Alrighty. Can you just give me a, a brief description of who you are and how you got involved with the John Birch Society? Well, I grew up in Texas and uh, went to school there and uh, went to Texas Tech and SMU and uh, got to the, uh, ended up with a degree in advanced traffic and transportation. Uh, but while at SMU, I got involved in the Young Republicans and uh, after about a oh, year or so of work with the Young Republicans, uh, found the John Birch Society. And I became a member and they made me a, a chapter leader and in the Dallas area and then a section leader which I had about a half a dozen chapters in a section of time that I oversaw. And then they hired me uh, in 68 to uh, go up to Oklahoma as the coordinator for the John Birch Society. And that was interesting, Oklahoma was a total Democrat state. And you mentioned that one of the first times we talked I feel you would understand better than most. Could you explain a little bit about how Kansas, Oklahoma, North Dakota, they all were surprisingly socialist back in the 50s and 40s? Well, that's because uh, the Democrats were controlled. Nothing happened in the state unless the Democrats decided. Like in Oklahoma, they controlled the governorship. They had all but one of the congressional seats. They controlled the high Oklahoma uh, State House. They controlled the Oklahoma State Senate. But what I find out that a lot of them were not the globalist, hardcore, let the socialists that we have today. There was a few, but there was a conservative wing in the Democrat Party where the conservatives kind of uh, just gravitated to, to talk to each other. And uh, I got to know them and uh, worked with some of them. Uh, one was Secretary of State. He and I became uh, good friends. Another one was uh, the... Uh, treasurer for the state, and uh, he and I became good friends, and a couple of good legislators, that, uh, and they, they were a big help on conservative projects, and uh, keeping me informed about things were going in there. But what was interesting about it, as the society grew up there, you know, we have a saying in the John Birch Society, one person of the Birch Society directly influences ten people through his activity, and indirectly through those ten influences another hundred. And uh, it holds pretty true. Uh, I mean, we've studied this for decades, and it's been whole, pretty true. And we know if we can get a foundation of 500 to 1,000 members built up in a congressional district, that district will change. Well, what happened when I was up in Oklahoma, uh, the society just started growing rapidly. And uh, we ended up with uh, 55 chapters of the John Birch Society uh, throughout the state. Now, we're not Republican, we're not Democrat, we're constitutionalists. Our, we don't tell our members what party to uh, belong to or what candidate to support, but they all gravitate to the Constitution, the strongest constitutionalist running, and uh, just by nature from what they understand about the Constitution. And uh, to shorten the whole story, by uh, I went up there in 68, and by the uh, 76, we totally flipped the state. The state flipped completely. Uh, they ended up with four Republican congressmen, a uh, Republican governor, and the Republicans that controlled the state house and the legislature. Uh, now, some of those Democrats switched, and, but, but there was not a Republican Party up there at that time. That's what was the big joke was uh, in most of the counties you could hold the Republican Party convention in a phone booth, and that was the big joke throughout the whole state. Well, I was I was kind of looking into the history of the JBS, and you explained Larry McDonald and how you get 500 people in a district, and it it'll flip, but. I'm wondering, I look now and I see Proud Boys, I see Antifa, I see these groups that are very short-lived but they burn very brightly. But the JBS has been active for decades and it's always been sort of low level. What makes it so effective and so long-lasting? Is it not publicity or...? No, we don't depend on the... It's all laying out the truth and having the organization to do it. This is one thing uh, in the, I guess you'd say, the American conservative movement, There's, uh, it, it presents a problem because, first of all, everybody's looking for a quick solution. Second of all, conservatives are independent by nature. They don't like to join. They're not joiners as such. Uh, they really like to be left alone and carved their own way on, not in life. And the, uh, in the, the Birch Society, we are formed and organized in the grassroots level, and we have a national field staff that works directly in every state in the union. 
uh, organizing those chapters, working with them, working through the projects on them. It's just like uh, the left uh, uh, complained, uh, like here in Georgia, uh, through the Atlanta Constitution, uh, they couldn't understand uh, what happened in the 7th District of Georgia with Larry McDonald being uh, uh, elected as a member of the John Birch Society. He was a right spoken member of the John Birch Society, and they said to him, that they're not, you go to their meetings and they don't talk Republican or Democrat, we talk about the Constitution and how we can educate our neighbors and friends and people we, we don't even know. And that's what I've genuinely liked about the JBS meetings here. It's, mm -hmm. you know, people will show up wearing the, the pins every now and then, but it's not about who's right and who's wrong. It's about yeah. the deeper issues. And like that uh, they're all going to go to one of the, the um, uh, I think it's a county meeting here on voter integrity. And, and they uh, also just take a part in the community. I yeah, saw yeah, that's them. Just it, yeah. they, they, that's, we think the battle is going to be won or lost in the local community. And we've seen other organizations try to replicate the uh, organization of the Birch Society, but they can't build that field staff. My cousin, he's a, an anthropologist at the University of Michigan, and he said that Robert Welch wanted the JBS to be structured like the Catholic Church, that it was very hierarchical, kind of like a business. Do you think that that structure had something to do with the success over the years? I think at the beginning of the year, I wouldn't say it was... I never heard that phrase like the Catholic Church, but he made it clear in the the Blue Book that uh, we uh, the John Birch Society was going to be monolithic in the upper echelons, and uh, that would be shifted and changed as we grew. But because of the uh, uh, the attacks against the Birch Society, because when we started out, we were campaigned to get us out of the United Nations, impeach the uh, Supreme Court justice. And we knew we didn't have a chance of increase, uh, impeaching the Supreme Court justice, but we knew by that program and doing it would educate a lot of people of what we had on the Supreme Court, how it was being manipulated, and uh, why we were getting bad decisions, and more and more people became aware of it, and that worked. Uh, you know, the Supreme Court's been a, a major issue ever since then. <laughs> Well, you mentioned a couple times ago, <clears throat> a couple of meetings ago, that modern conservatism and, and John Birch-style conservatism really evolved around Barry Goldwater. That it, because I, I see two different kinds of conservatism. I see more populist conservatism, and I see Ron Paul conservatism. Mm -hmm. Would you say that the JBS is less authoritarian conservative? Would you say that they're more do as you will, so long as it well, doesn't affect me? Um, Barry Goldwater was where they took the beginning of the conservative philosophy and explained it in the political realm uh, in, the, in the, the book Barry wrote. And in fact, that's what caught my attention because he was definitely showing in the book that uh, the conservative movement in the Republican Party had to be based and grow from outside the party but would affect the party or the Democrat Party too. And uh, that, that's, uh, and he, he did his best to explain it. And uh, I know I read the book a couple times. I was so fascinated by it because it was a different realm of thinking. You just think, oh, I'm going to go join the party and uh, go vote and hear a couple people talk and we're going to win. It, it doesn't work. <laughs> well, I feel you'd be more qualified to talk on this. I'm wondering, because Barry Goldwater, you said you've got to bring in people from the outside, mm -hmm. which I think is exactly what Ron Paul did. Well, Ron Paul grew up in that. And, uh, of course, the Libertarian Party and Ron Paul, uh, they were all younger then. In fact, I saw a younger picture of Ron Paul here when he was first started in Congress. I didn't even recognize him when he was young. <laughs> and you're friends with him? Yes, I've, I've, known, I've known him for years. <laughs> well, I'm wondering, and, and you don't have to name names and be like, that politician I don't like. I've heard them. I've heard the JBS talk about the flaws of left-wing mm -hmm. ideology. But how? What do you think the flaws are that we could improve on in conservatism? The I, I think the biggest thing is always keep the door open to talk to people because just like I learned, people are learning today, and you don't want to make enemies of them. You don't want to attack them and say, "Well, oh, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard." Uh, what's the matter with you? you know, use your brains or something. You don't want to insult them because they're looking for the truth. And that's why, uh, just like in this room with all the books here, a lot of them were published by us, were carried by us. We educate people. And, uh, you know, 
I can say, well, I'm not a, a expert on the Supreme Court, but here is an excellent book that traces the whole history of the Supreme Court and why we're having problems today. And usually when people start digging into that and everything, they come back and want more information and they get involved and so forth after that. And uh, it's, it's just the nature of, you know, just the conservatives today. I run into them all the time. They just think that, oh, well, I'll put a sign up a month before the election and uh, go to a couple speeches and we're going to win the thing. Well, no, the work was already done by that point, <laughs> and we say our real work, our real work in the Birch Society, starts the day after the last major election. One of the things that I was talking with uh, Bob Heine mm -hmm. about is I feel like the JBS doesn't treat people like they're dumb. I've seen a lot of other political events where they'll just repeat a couple slogans and give each other pats on the back, but you come to those JBS meetings and they've done their homework and they're citing laws and they're talking about the history of different acts. I feel like not treating your supporters like they're fifth graders is a very good approach to politics. Well, it's always been. That's the way Mr. Welch wanted it. And also, even if they're liberals, if they're questioning a certain point, we hope that they look at what we're saying and what the point that they accepted. And many people say, well, hey, this makes more sense over here, what the Birch Society says, and what this is more political or self-serving on the other side, or the, it's against the Constitution. And when they reach that point, uh, the involvement increases very much so to reach other people. And uh, I'm going over some more historic questions. So you mentioned Ron Paul. Mm -hmm. uh, two questions. One, you said the other day at the meeting that you had a story with him in a plane. Mm -hmm. And the second one is, I'm curious, because I've been studying uh, league tickets, sort of uh, federation leagues that come together and they influence the primaries and get mm -hmm. their candidate put in, which is what we were trying to do with Ron Paul. Mm -hmm. And then he ran Libertarian in 1988. Do you think that that caused a rift for people? Because he didn't do it in 2012. I didn't see a rift uh, when he, because uh, he was still in the Republican Party and was running in this, uh, uh, well, was a congressman in the Republican Party. He, you know, he served a few terms and then he took some time out uh, and left the Congress. Uh, as he said, uh, had some kids going into college and I, I wanted to be with them as they went through any after they got him through college, he came back and he ran again and won. And when he came back to run again, it was amazing watching uh, not only the left lining up against him, but even some well-known Republicans at that time that were opposing him. And they actually, in uh, I can't I wish I could remember the congressman's name that was in that district. Uh, he was a Democrat. And they talked him into switching to the Republican Party, so the hierarchy of the party, the party could endorse him against Ron Paul, because they knew Ron was coming back to run in the primary. One of them was uh, uh, Newt Gingrich, uh, endorsed the, the the fellow that was a Democrat running as a Republican, and uh, so we took a look at this, and the polls were showing that uh, Ron Paul was slightly behind, maybe about one, one and a half percentage points in most of the polls because of these endorsements. And we got thinking about it and they said, well, let's, let's take one, the, let's do this. Let the people make the decision. Let's print the voting record on about 20 bills for the Democrat switch and the Republican and take 20 bills Excuse me. Uh, of uh, the uh, re Republicans uh, of Ron Paul on the same issues and where how they voted and so forth. Because we had votes on both of them when Ron Paul was in office and this other guy was in office too. So we did and we put it on one, it was like on a newspaper sheet. And uh, there it was, did they vote for more government or less government, did they vote for more spending, less government? here was the Ron Paul's vote on the same on the bill and the, the guy that was running for the office when he was in uh, his, off, his, his vote too. And uh, what, what, what happened is uh, how that all came together was on redistricting too. He was a, a, journey, uh, a joining congressman to Ron Paul's district, but they threw it all back. And when Ron Paul uh, dropped out, they put the whole dist those districts together 
and our members and chapters just went throughout the whole district, uh, like a newspaper, putting them on some at everybody's porch or at the base of the mailbox. And election day came, and Ron Paul won by about three percentage points. And he called me up and he said, you know, we were just about at the end of the rope. Uh, and he said, uh, uh, we didn't even tell him we were doing this. We just did it. And uh, he said that uh, you saved me. And of course, when he got back in there, he, you know, he, he talked when he spoke. He, uh, that was a, a good nature. It just wasn't just political. He, he taught principles and everything. He kept winning by larger margins and as a result of that. But that's how you set the foundation. Enough people saw that and they said, well, hey, I saw this guy vote. I don't agree with anything <laughs> or, or half of what he's done. I don't agree with him. The Ron Paul saving us money and so forth. So they, well, now that had a real strong effect on the undecided. Now that you mention it, Ron Paul, to me, the reason I liked him so much was because he seems the same as a JBS meeting. Mm -hmm. It's not just slogans. It's teaching. Mm -hmm. It's a lecture. Yeah, it's... Uh, we look at it as a, a constant learning process, and uh, most of our information is, uh, that we print and carry and put out is to back that up and give you the documentation and the facts you need and what the other side was saying too. We uh, we read the other side of the material, uh, so we know exactly what they're going in. Well, the JBS has always kind of gone over the theories in the news at the time, and I've seen a lot of very interesting ones that get put out. Mm -hmm. And you actually were talking a couple meetings ago just in passing about JFK, and I found a guy, Harry Dean. Have you ever heard of Harry Dean? No, I haven't heard of him. He infiltrated the John Birch Society for a few months in 1962. Okay, see, I, I wasn't a member then. But so he was in Dallas and he was just he was in conservative groups okay. and he claimed they did it. <laughs> they killed Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And so I don't believe that for a second, but I read a little bit of what he wrote. And would it be all right if I asked some questions, if you knew some people who were active in the conservative movement yeah. in the early 60s? Uh, did you ever meet this undercover Harry Dean guy at any of the Republican groups? I or? Don't, don't remember the name. I can't. No, uh, and I was mainly uh, active in the Young Republicans at that time. It was 63 when I joined the Birch Society. Well, the uh, Young Republicans, what? who were they founded by? Or were they just kind of a... They were there. It was uh, part of the uh, Republicans were getting started in Dallas. And, uh, oh, I can't remember the fellow's name that started the Young Republican Club. Uh, he was an attorney, that's all I remember. Yeah, and he was about my age at that time. And that's what attracted me, and I got into it. And he was educated. That, that attracted me, too. And then they made me an officer the following year in it, and that's when I got involved in the Birch Society, too, and the, the, uh, continued the education. And, and I ended up uh, in 64, 65, being the chairman of the Young Republican Club. Very quick so if, rise. Ha if Harry Dean was there, or, uh, I didn't know him. <laughs> <laughs> he, he did seem like... One of those people who was on the block when the assassination happened mm -hmm. and wanted to make it about him. Mm -hmm. uh, around that time, he bases a lot of what he's saying on the John Birch Society was in Dallas passing out this pamphlet about how John F. Kennedy was basically uh, bowing down to the Soviets, making concessions to the Cubans and abandoning Katanga. Uh, what were the attitudes of the young Republicans, the John Birch Society, towards JFK? They were concerned about them and uh, concerned about the uh, the foreign policies, uh, his support of the United Nations, uh, a lot of questions. And of course, that's why we were trying to get the information out. Uh, here, read this and look at this, and here, this will answer this question. Well, one of the things I just wanted to point out for the viewers is supporting the UN back then was different because mm -hmm. it was a real question over supporting Taiwan versus China. Yeah. It, they felt abandoned, stabbed in the back, and millions well, and, of people were dying. And there was a big eternal fight going on in China at that time, too, between uh, uh, Chiang Kai-shek and the Christians in China that were in control. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek's wife was a Christian, and 
he allowed him, her to open up China for missionaries to come in, welcome them. Like John Birch himself? And, and, well, like John Birch himself, yeah, because John Birch was a missionary. And then uh, at the same time, uh, when you study it, Mayo Tae Sung and the hardcore communists were working in the northern provinces trying to get a foothold. And then when Japan attacked China, uh, Mayo Tae Sung figured, well, this is going to put a lot of pressure on the Chinese government. Let's see what we can do to take advantage of it to gain power. So they started making their move, taking over northern provinces, uh, uh, killing off mayors of towns and putting their people in. And it was not a, it, it wasn't something that just happened like this. It was a, a, an ongoing process. And I guess a couple more questions about uh, more recent history, and I do plan on going and visiting John Birch's grave. Uh, what day did you say John Birch Day was? Because I haven't found what day, like it used to be a holiday. Um, I'll get that out of the book here for you. Uh, it's um, just time of year. Uh, I have to get the exact date for you. Out of it. Does the, you uh, his birthday or the day he died or what? I think you said that uh, every year you do a JBS day yeah, yeah, or a John Birch it's, day. Yeah, John Birch day dinner or John Birch day celebration. It's usually in August, the first part of September, right, right, right in the period we're in right now. I still want to get the whole uh, chapter to go clean this grave off because it's kind of overgrown. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I guess moving back to some of the uh, later conspiracies. Uh, so, in one of those theories about the JBS in Dallas and conservatives in Dallas, he mentions Congressman John Russolo mm -hmm. and General Edwin Walker. Mm -hmm. I'm especially interested in General Walker. Uh, did you know any of these? Did you know either of them? I knew who they were. Uh, met both of them. Uh, can you give me your thoughts, especially on General Walker, because he's a fascinating guy? Well, okay, let me give you just a quick one on Russo. Russo was from California, uh, Southern California, and the Birch Society had grown very strong there, particularly in Southern California, and he ran for Congress and won, and won re-election several times, and more or less became the uh, conservative voice that was growing in the uh, uh, the Republican Party at that time, which Ron Paul later moved into that, that sphere. And, some other ones too. Uh, General Walker was uh, head of our troops over uh, in an element in Europe and uh, lived in Dallas. Uh, came back and uh, was living in Dallas at that time. And uh, now this is what's interesting. There was, uh, he was speaking out uh, about the communist uh, and uh, the spread of communism in Europe and uh, the coddling of Cong congressmen, uh, co the communists, they called it there. And uh, living in his house, and there was an attempt on his life. It, uh, actually, they shot and missed him, was what they, they amounted amount to, but it was an attempt on his life. And uh, that kind of rattled him. Uh, do you know who uh, tried shooting at him? No, nope, nobody ever knows. We don't know to this day who it was. You know, the... Uh I believe congressional investigation into JFK said that was Oswald. Uh, I've heard that, but you, that's all. You can't connect anything up there. Uh, yeah, they saw two people leaving in separate cars, running after they heard the shot, and Oswald didn't have a driver's license and didn't know how to drive. Yeah, I've heard that story, but uh, boy, trying to prove it or disprove it's tough. Uh, you just have to, you know, keep it there as something to consider. And uh, well, when you met him, and then Walker kind of withdrew uh, a little bit after that. He was still outspoken, but he kind of withdrew. And uh, he, um, uh, occasionally, he he would get off uh, the main conservative line, uh, and uh, you know we we respected him. What he did, he's part of the military, but uh, as time went on, we had to just... Uh, a little too extreme? Well, he, yeah, he was going off on, on, on things that couldn't be proven, let me put it that way. So, what makes me so interested about Walker is, one, he, I think he was the inspiration for uh, Dr. or General Jack D. Ripper. 
from Dr. Strangelove. You ever mm-hmm. watched that? Yeah. <laughs> Do you think that he might have served as kind of inspiration well, I, for that, that? That's interesting you saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go against you. <laughs> <laughs> he was saying, uh, I believe one of the accusations was he was trying to get his men to start something or to begin the initial conflict because the politicians weren't going to allow it to actually happen. I'm going to, um, I'm going to go back. Uh, we have a magazine called the New American Magazine. It used to be called American Opinion Magazine. But before then, at the very finding of the Bird Society, it, called, it was called One Man's Opinion. It was mainly written by Mr. Welsh. And I think he had some commentary in those magazines on Edwin Walker. I'm going to go back and check that. That'd be interesting to see. Well, so this goes back to also I was interviewing that uh, he was not JBS. This man I interviewed before you, he was a very Mm right-wing, authoritarian right-wing. But he mentioned General Walker, and he brought up a series of other generals, uh, Van Horn Mosley, Admiral Cromelin, and he said essentially that there were basically a group of very high-ranking men, many of them World War I military heroes Mm -hmm. that wanted a coup, if not a coup, a forcible move into Washington, D.C. and clearing out of the house. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that might have been true? Because uh, you've heard uh, yeah, war is a racket. Uh, yeah, I, I, I never even touched anything like that because that was, you know, I was young, just I was learning every day. Oh, I wouldn't think that you were a part of it or anything. <laughs> well, even if it was going on, uh, I was so interested in uh, you know, growing the uh, Young Republican Club. And in fact, I remember the uh, county chairman called me one time and. Uh, asked me to have dinner with him, and he said, you know, uh, we're really impressed with what's happened to the Young Republican Club. And I said, what do you mean? He says, do you know you're at the second biggest club in the Dallas County in the Republican Party, the only one that's bigger than the men's Republican Club? And I said, no, I didn't know that. And, uh, then he said something really, really interesting, and uh, he uh, went on saying, yeah, you've reached a lot of people, and uh, you've got a lot of... Uh, couples involved in it and I'm, he's going on and I'm thinking where's the butt coming from and it came and he says uh, I said he said but we're watching how well you adhere to Republican Party policy and that threw the red flag up to me and I, I said uh, what you mean is that uh, I we have to support a Republican, no matter where he stands on principle, whether we agree or disagree, but the Republican label comes more important. And he said, we have to get all Republicans elected and everything. And he said, I've had some complaints about some, he said, business people. And uh, he said that, they, this is the exact words, that they were very interested in you because of what you've accomplished and having you run for a higher office something. And, that, and that, now they're concerned because uh, the uh, uh, you're not supporting and having some Republicans talk to the club. And I said, well, you're telling me that I have to have a David Rockefeller speak to the club as much as a Barry Goldwater. And they said, yes, and I said, you can't do that. And anyway, that's what he told me. He said, well, uh, we want, we, we would like you to support all Republicans. And I said, uh, uh, or we're going to have to take the charter away. And I said, okay, uh, I learned right there something I learned through my family. Uh, when you're faced with a situation like that, shut up and think your way through it before you say the next word. Because <laughs> you're liable to get mad and say the wrong thing. And I said, okay, I have uh, 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 about 16 people helping run the groups on different committees and everything. They're all in the decision making. We meet every month and decide who we're going to have as speakers and what to do. And I says, I'm going to go back and tell them this story. And if they vote for us to just support everybody and anything that comes along, I'll give them my resignation. And if they vote to continue on the way we are, uh, on principle, I'll continue to run the club. So I left. Uh, called all the committee members. One of the um, people in the, uh, on the committee had to die in time office. I told him the story, 
a little more detail. I went through you, uh, you and asked if we could use his office. We got everybody together. I told them the whole story as best as uh, what happened. And I said, now I'm going to leave the room. And I'm going to let you discuss this out among yourself. If you have a question, you can send somebody out to talk, uh, ask me, you know, and I'll try to answer the question. But you're going to make this decision. And I, gave, I said, if you vote to break uh, what we're doing, I would resign. And you can run with it, do what you want with it then. But if you vote to support it, we'll continue on. Uh, our, our, our education course that we're taking. I was out of the room maybe a half an hour, and one guy came out and got me, and they went in, and they said they had discussed it, and uh, they had voted 16 to nothing to continue on the way we are. And I said, well, if, if, uh, I will continue on the run, and we'll have our meetings and so forth. So the Republican Party took our charter away as a result of it. But that actually helped us. And uh, the way it helped us is uh, we could support whoever we wanted in the Republican primary. Any candidates were running. And sometimes there were three or four candidates running for a position. And as under the thumb of the Republican Party, we had to give all four of them a forum. And, uh, and, and more or less be uncommitted a moment. But, uh, but we could pick the best one we want to support them. And I openly support them, too, because we weren't tied in with us. And boy, when we did that a couple of times, they didn't know what to do with us. We renamed the club the Young Adult Republican Club. We aged, uh, brought the age limit really up from uh, uh, 21 to 30, because we wanted to uh, particularly get, draw in young couples. And it worked. And we had hundreds of people in the, in the uh the club. But, Whatever became of the club? Well, we turned. Uh, I was asked to go to work for the John Birch Society at that time, and uh, we turned it over to some other people, and they continued. And of course, I had moved to Oklahoma, so I lost. Uh, the, the club continued on for a number of years, but the long range, uh, what happened to it? Uh, it's just, I was involved with something else. <laughs> um. Well, as far as. Uh anti-communism and conservatism in Dallas mm -hmm. and in Texas. I'm wondering, would you guys be mainly concerned with domestic politics, or would you ever have speakers from Yugoslavia, from China, from Cuba, from Russia, to like tell you guys about what went wrong in their country? Well, both. And we have members, uh, like I just talked to a doctor, a female doctor, her uh, parents escaped from uh, Russia, and uh, she young she came here and established her own clinic and uh, she I asked her are you really just she says you know what's what's happening here in this country is what we saw happening in our country when the communists took over and I said will you be willing to speak out on it she said yes so no we have speakers uh, that escaped communism uh, lived through some horrible situations on that same line there was this theory that uh, there was a guy in there, Eladio Deval, uh, V A L L E, Devalle. He was a Cuban that worked with some exiles in Dallas and in mm -hmm. Louisiana, and he was anti communist. And he was formerly, I believe, a congressman in Havana. And a couple years after uh, the mid 60s or early 70s, he was tortured to death in Miami. And they still don't know who did it. Mm -hmm. But he was anti-communist and he was involved with groups like the JBS and with different conservative groups. Have you ever heard of him? or? haven't heard of him, but uh, I was later uh, promoted and made over the uh, head of the southeast of the United States for the Bird Society. And uh, that took me into Miami and I got to meet a lot. We, we had uh, Cuban chapters of the John Bird Society down there. And it was fascinating talking to those people. What they, there was an element that uh, could see what was happening. They had enough understanding of history, uh, of communism, and uh, they made planned in advance to leave. Uh, they knew Castro was a communist, and they, uh, well, basically what they did, they put their money in banks in the United States or in Mexico. And then they began to transfer out of their business interests and transfer it into some addresses in the United States or um, South America or somewhere wherever they were going. And then 
suddenly they decided, well, the board was we're going on vacation. They left and never came back uh, because they could see the communist revolution take place. And then there was other ones that literally uh, were approached by Castro when he was taken over and asked to compromise. And, you know, uh, well, we'll let you live in your house and work your farm, but it's going to be under our direction. And many of them escaped, too. In fact, I talked to one, one man. He said, I, he says, I literally, with my family, we fought a gun battle going over roofs of houses in the, to get to the airport to get to the last plane out. <laughs> wow. <laughs> to come to, to get out of uh, um, Cuba. Would you say, so one of the things that comes up in my research with that is there was a, a family, the Traficante family, that had a lot of businesses in Havana and mm -hmm. just around Cuba, and they helped evacuate people and really helped support groups mm -hmm. that were conservative and anti-communist. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have any experience with that? I've, yeah, I've heard about it. I've heard about it. And met some of them in, in Cuba. Like I said, they were fast, it was fascinating talking to them. And they were... Most of the Cubans, because the ones in the Bird Society, were strongly anti-communist. But they, they said, we learned something through the Bird Society. We didn't know the difference between a republic and a democracy. Of course, that's understanding the Constitution. Is that we understood, as we understood the Constitution, we began to realize how we were manipulated under the word of uh, democracy in, in Cuba under Castro. Well, Castro, to me, is the most interesting case because he said he wasn't a communist. He said, I believe he said he wasn't even a socialist. Well, he lied because before the, ca the, uh, resolu uh, the revolution in Cuba, a few years before that, he tried to pull off the communist revolution in Colombia. Mr. Welsh wrote about it. We got the documentation on that. And our State Department was just silent about the whole thing. They knew it when he was working in Cuba. Cuba what he had done, tried to do in Colombia. Have you heard about what happened when, uh, so he, Castro has control over Cuba and he now understands the purpose of being the puppet for larger communist nations like Russia and China. Well, he sent Che Guevara, who was very much a fighting spirit to Bolivia and didn't give him proper ammunition mm -hmm. or a working radio. I just, I thought that was interesting that he kind of just tossed his wild dogs aside. Well, he was getting in trouble when he um, had a, uh, particularly with Russia. Russia came and made these deals with them. Well, I will help you, but here, you know, we got to let, let us run this and do this, and he went along with it. Would you say the Cubans that you worked with were particularly militant? Because I've seen... The ones I work with? Uh, met, no. They, uh, I mean, they wouldn't have hesitated to fight for their property and their family, but uh, they had a pretty good understanding of the turmoil that that causes and how it could be used against you. Just like today, the left would love to have a uh, uprising by some purported conservative right-wing organization they call it, and do something violent, just like they're playing, trying to do with January 6th in order to federalize the police and use the local police against the people to control them and to bring the military into it too. Well, one of the thing I keep, things I keep coming across in my research is groups like Alpha 66, uh, the Free Cuba Committee, which was conservative, uh, Omega 7 Brigade uh, 2506, I believe. Mm -hmm. All these groups that were uh, basically militias that were launching raids on Castro's mm -hmm. forces around the island. Were you aware of anybody that was actually going into Cuba and doing sabotage, or were the people that were in the southeast more political hoping to solve it like that no they were they were trying to help some people in Cuba but it was tough and uh, it was getting tougher and then of course many of them were starting from scratch they're starting their business over again uh, and one thing that was very very clear with them is most of them looked at it as being an embarrassment to stand out in the corner and selling carrots or apples on the street corner to survive they, and they didn't want any government handout and uh, they built their businesses, uh, built their families. Very uh, prideful. Yeah, and very, uh, uh, I mean, they just were glued to the Constitution. Because it was, they had read it, knew a little bit, they never studied it, knew why, though. 